We know how the greenhouse effect works to raise global temperatures. Next, let's explore how feedback loops can either keep us in balance or send global temperatures skyrocketing out of control. First, negative feedback. Negative feedback keeps systems in balance. If your body gets too hot, it triggers sweating, which is evaporative cooling, and which cools you down. Or it causes your face to get red, as your blood flows to capillaries near the surface of your skin to cool the blood and your body. Similarly, if your body gets too cool, you shiver. Shivering is simple muscle, simply muscle contractions designed to warm you up. Or you get goosebumps, which cause your hairs to stand on end, effectively trapping more air near your skin to insulate you. Natural systems have many, many built-in negative feedback mechanisms to keep the system in balance. Consider the carbon cycle. In a limited sense, if more CO2 is in the atmosphere, perhaps there would be more photosynthesis by plants, thus reducing this atmospheric CO2 pool. That's negative feedback. Similarly, if global temperatures rise, perhaps there will be more evaporation in clouds, thus blocking some of the incoming sunlight, which could cool the earth. Again, a negative feedback loop. So overall, negative feedback is a good thing. Positive feedback, on the other hand, leads to death and destruction. Positive feedback occurs when an event occurs that causes the situation to intensify. So warming that brings on even more warming. As the note says here, positive feedback is not positive. Quite the opposite. It will lead to death in your body and uncontrolled warming with climate change. A great example of positive feedback is shown here on infographic 21.4. Light colored materials like ice are good reflectors. Darker material, like water and soil, are good at absorbing solar radiation. As Arctic ice melts, there's less ice to reflect the sun's shortwave radiation, and more dark water that is better at absorbing the sunlight and then re-radiating it as heat. So the melting of the ice leads to more water area exposed, which absorbs more radiation and melts more ice which leads to more water air exposed, which absorbs more radiation, which melts more ice, etc. Positive feedback. Similarly, on land, as Greenland's ice sheet melts, there's more dark land exposed, which absorbs more radiation and heats up, which melts more ice, which exposes more land, etc. Positive feedback. At some point, a positive feedback loop can become virtually unstoppable. Scientists fear this with the melting of glacial ice and with the release of carbon dioxide as the permafrost melts in the Arctic. I encourage you to research several negative and positive feedback loops related to climate change. It's one of the learning objectives for this topic. Next, let's look at some of the effects of climate change. First, melting ice. There are many types of ice that can melt, and this slide deals with the melting of continental ice sheets, a type of glacial ice. Glacial ice is ice that exists on land, and the continental ice sheets are those in Antarctica and Greenland. The melting of continental ice sheets leads to sea level rise. Ice sheets contain an enormous quantity of frozen water. Most people don't understand how much. In fact, most of the Earth's fresh water is in these two ice sheets. If the Greenland ice sheet melted, scientists estimate that sea level would rise about 6 meters, or 20 feet. If all of the Antarctic ice sheet were to melt, sea level would rise by about 200 feet. That's an enormous amount of water. Nobody's suggesting that these two ice sheets are going to melt tomorrow. But they are melting, faster than we anticipated and that will lead to the rising ocean levels. Indeed, this ice has already raised global sea levels, and entire island nations are planning for evacuation. Notably, 25% of the world's population lives in coastal communities. Consider the United States. Major California cities are all coastal. 
New York City is coastal, and many cities in Florida are coastal. All these cities are dealing now with issues associated with sea level rise. Throwing money at levees and other infrastructure will help, but what about countries that aren't as rich as the United States? Some glacial ice exists on mountaintops, not as continental ice sheets. Indeed, seasonal meltwater from glacial ice in the Andes and in the Himalayas is a vital water source for many South American and South Asian countries. What happens when those glaciers are gone? Non-glacial ice is melting as well, such as the Arctic sea ice. This melting does not cause ocean levels to rise, but it does impact ecosystems. Additionally, it opens the Arctic up to more oil extraction. Yikes! Another type of ice that is melting is permafrost, frozen water and soil that exists several inches or feet below the subsurface in Alaska, Canada, and other Arctic land areas. This melting may destroy pipelines and other infrastructure. And importantly, it will also thaw lots of organic material that will then undergo rapid decomposition, sending huge amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. In some cases, as in the case of polar bears, the melting ice may actually severely impact their ability to survive. But there are also other ways that species, and thus biodiversity, may be impacted. Consider warmer climates setting up a region for easier establishment of invasive species. Or, as discussed earlier, changes in flowering and migration timing, and changing geographic ranges. Hmm. As ranges shift, it's possible that one or more species in an ecological community may be able to shift its range as well, but it's unlikely that the entire ecological community, that all supports each other, will be able to shift its range in such a short time frame. Further, there are a host of range of tolerance issues related to climate change, from warming oceans to decreased oxygen content in warmer waters, to increased ocean acidity due to increased dissolved CO2. If one or more species in any community is affected by any of these issues, whole ecological communities may be at risk due to the food chain interactions. Let's look at a specific range of tolerance issue. The, the temperature of our oceans is warming, and, as noted, many species may have range of tolerance issues with temperature. Coral reefs stressed by temperature force out their symbiotic algae partners, which results in the bleaching of coral reefs, which can lead to their death, and thus the destruction of one of the ocean's most important ecosystems. Next, let's look at a range of tolerance issue for pH. As the oceans absorb more carbon dioxide, some of that carbon dioxide reacts with water to form carbonic acid. Coral and other shelled organisms essentially dissolve in acidic conditions. It's much more difficult for all corals and shelled organisms to survive as ocean acidity increases. We can also expect changes in precipitation patterns. Now the figure in this slide is very old, and the modeling that produced it may be outdated. I'm not sure. Though what we can be sure of is that global precipitation patterns are changing. IPCC's fifth assessment report indicated that many regions will experience longer dry periods, so increased drought, and other regions may experience heavier rains. It may be true, as this model suggests, that parts of California may actually get more rainfall. That sounds good, but early spring rains will destroy our primary water storage system snowpack. In California, our reservoirs hold only a very small percentage of our total water needs for the year. We rely on the gradual melting of snowpack through the spring and into the early, mid, and even late summer to continually feel, fill our reservoirs. With spring rains, we would end up with devastating flooding in the spring, and then we'd run out of water by mid to late summer. Indeed, changing precipitation patterns will be disruptive for many reasons. Drought, increased fire risk, decreased crop productivity, and on the other extreme, flooding. All of these impacts we've started to see 
around the world. And all these impacts also create refugees. We often think of refugees and, and even war as stemming from political or religious issues. But really, many of today's conflicts are about control of resources. If energy, food, and water resources were abundant and well distributed, we would have far fewer conflicts in the world. Lastly, as your book mentions, we need to be prepared for an increase in heat-related illnesses and deaths, and also, perhaps more striking, an increase in insect-related diseases, as the demise of cold, frigid winters also mean that tropical insect populations will be free to migrate further into temperate regions. In this video, we mention just a few of the many possible impacts of climate change. Many of these impacts are now inevitable, or they are already present. How can we prepare societies for these consequences? What adaptation strategies should we employ? Notably, to deal with climate change, we now need to take two types of action simultaneously mitigation, and adaptation. Mitigation means that we take steps to reduce future warming. For example, we reduce greenhouse gas emissions by reducing fossil fuel combustion. You can likely think of many very specific ways that we can mitigate climate change. Adaptation measures mean that we take steps to make living with climatic change possible. For example, we build higher levees, or we develop drought-tolerant strains of agricultural plants, etc. You should also be able to think of many other strategies we can do that will help us better adapt to the changing climatic conditions. Understanding mitigation and adaptation, and being able to come up with examples of each is part of this topic's homework assignment and also um, one of the major learning objectives for the topic. Ten years ago, I used to show this slide, which shows the relationship between mitigation and adaptation, showing two paths we can take. If we do less mitigation, we're going to end up with more serious climatic change effects and more adaptation is going to be required. If instead we do more mitigation now, we'll have less serious climatic change effects and less adaptation will be required. Clearly, we've pretty much gone this route. We have a lot of adaptation that needs to be done. However, that doesn't mean that we should stop working on mitigation. In fact, it's even more important now that we dramatically work to mitigate so that we can try to still avoid the most serious climate change impacts. What can you do? There are many steps we can all take to mitigate climate change. Additionally, what is your community doing in terms of mitigation and adaptation? Here, we live right around the bay. We're going to experience rising sea levels, which will increase the levels in the bay as well. What's going to be done? We can also expect hotter temperatures, more extreme weather events, extended droughts, perhaps more invasive species, and perhaps more insect-borne diseases. What are your communities doing to prepare for that? There's a lot that can still be done regarding both mitigation and adaptation. I encourage you to pay attention and get involved.